So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the session. My name is Magdalena Gross Hodge, and together with Lorna Hamilton here, we're going to talk about ways in which you can neurodiversify your curriculum. Both Lorna and I are members of the neurodiversity group within Fort. So what is Fort? Framework for open and reproducible research training is a community-driven organization which was designed by and for educators who wish to engage open science principles into their teaching. In fact, Flavio, the director of Ford, has just been shortlisted for the Dorothy Bishop Price Award, and we're keeping our fingers crossed he will get it. Our community supports teaching of open science principles by providing resources. They can all be found on um, our educational nexus or our learning platform, which is divided into a number of sections. In the bottom right corner, you can see some of the components, and I am not going to go through all of them today. You can familiarize yourself with them on our website. What I'm going to highlight is what you can see here in green, the curated resources created by the neurodiversity group within Fort. Our community is growing quickly. At the moment, um, the number of scholars uh, that belong to the organization exceeds uh, 700, and our members represent a variety of fields. So our aim, we would like to support um, educators in promotion and adoption of open scholarship practices in higher education generate a conversation about ethics and social impact of higher education pedagogy, as well as promote a reflection about perceived importance of different academic activities and advocate for greater recognition of educational resources. Now, without doubt, within the last five years, we have witnessed remarkable progress within open science. However, the teaching has received relatively little attention. Focus on pedagogy is crucial as embedding open scholarship values in classroom activities will facilitate a quicker adoption of open science practices. Therefore, we provide resources which are available to all educators interested in promoting open scholarship. Our materials invite educators and students to engage in epistemological discussions and to reflect on the core values of open science. Now you're probably familiar with the core value, uh, values under the umbrella of open science movement. Today, we would like to discuss how these can be embedded in our teaching and why incorporating them benefits all of us in academia. Um, so, Let's move on to neurodiversity. Um, our team uh, has been established uh, to promote neurodiversity within science. So what is neurodiversity? It is the non-pathological variation in cognitive functions. Now, inclu it includes neurotypicals um, as well as those who identify as neurodivergent. The term neurodivergent refers to neurotypes that differ from that of the majority. For example, autistic or dyslexic individuals. Now, even though neurodiversity and open science movement share many core values, neurodiversity has not received as much attention within the open science scholarship movement as we would like to. Therefore, the aim of our group is to raise awareness of diversity in academia, build community and increase the visibility of the work produced by neurodivergent scholars and educators. So, as I mentioned, neurodiversity and open scholarship share um, a number of values. They both hold social justice at heart, they promote equity and opportunity of opportunity. 
and call for collaborative team approaches would draw on individual strength. Now, I am going to hand it over to Lorna, but you will see me pop up and tell you about the lesson pack that we have prepared and are going to share with you. We're going to tell you how the lessons we have prepared embed these values and how you can use them in class. Thanks, Magda. Hi, everyone. My name's uh, Lorna. Um, so we're going to talk about what we mean by neurodiversifying um, the Open Scholarship curriculum over the next few slides and give um, some worked examples through um, the lesson pack that accompanies this workshop, which you can find uh, at the link at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so in recent years, you'll be very aware of the movement to increase representation of minoritized groups um, in academic curricula and to improve the relevance of those curricula for diverse student populations. So our call to neurodiversify the curriculum very much sits within that decolonization um, tradition and follows and learns from those uh, movements that have gone before. Um, so given the prevalence of neurodivergent conditions, um, every classroom will be neurodiverse. Um, and there are well-evidenced benefits of cognitive diversity in groups in terms of tackling complex problems, in resisting confirmation bias and groupthink. So as educators, um, we argue that we should all reflect on how we can neurodiverse neurodiversify the curricula that we teach to give our neurodivergent students uh, the best support to flourish in education and beyond. So we're going to talk about three pillars of neurodiversification. Um, so raising awareness of neurodiversity in, uh, through our curricula, including um, open scholarship curricula. Talking about difference, um, including uh, uh, neurodiversity in this case openly, transparently, um, in non-pathologizing ways and with empathy, and designing and delivering what we teach uh, for a diverse student audience. Move on to the next slide, Magda, thank you. Um, so by now, I think everyone is probably aware that um, representation in education really matters. It's really important for our students that they see themselves represented in the curricula um, which they study. Um, we know that many neurodivergent scientists and academics don't disclose their diagnosis, um, because, at least partly because neurodivergent conditions, including autism, ADHD and dyslexia are often highly stigmatized and perhaps especially within academic contexts. Uh, but our neurodivergent students need role models to aspire to, um, and that's why the activism science of autistic and other neurodivergent scholars in recent years has been uh, so important and so inspiring. So we wanted to, um, in, in order to think about how we might increase representation of neurodivergent scholars uh, within the open, open science curricula, we wanted to highlight one uh, very recent um, initiative that the Thought Team Neurodiversity has been working on. And in fact, the lead of this, um, this initiative is in the room, uh, Emily. Hi, Emily. Um, so this is a new database of neurodivergent uh, researchers, which is uh, linked in the slides. Um, and the purpose of this resource um, is to counteract, counteract some um, existing bias towards neurotypicality uh, in the research literature, to challenge deficit-oriented paradigms of neurodiversity, which pathologize minority neurotypes and instead promote uh, a neurodiversity paradigm. So neurodivergent inclusion requires a shift from that pathologizing medical model approach, which, which focuses almost exclusively on deficits to a more balanced understanding of differences and disabilities that individuals experience. So we intend this uh, database to be a resource for neurodivergent authors themselves to reduce the stigma around neurodivergence in research by providing representation and role models and to help them find other neurodivergent scholars to collaborate with. It's also um, intended for educators who are seeking to neurodiversify curricula and create inclusive syllabi. By incorporating neurodivergent authors into reading lists, we can foster a sense of belonging and agency amongst our neurodivergent students and colleagues of, of all neurotypes and not, not only neurodivergent. 
so with this resource, we're hoping to inspire academics to reflect on our attitude, to embrace all neurotypes and to initiate constructive discussions that challenge these hidden biases that we have that are pervasive throughout academic curricula. Uh, so you can you can um, you can click on the link uh, through these slides and, and explore this and we uh, invite any neurodivergent scholars out there who would like to um, register themselves and add their work to this database, please to do so. So one of the key um, outcomes that we hope for this is to create a safe environment for disclosure to encourage um, disclosure amongst academics mm -hmm. and students um, of <clears throat> neurodivergent status in order to reduce stigma. Okay, so as well as um, in, um, increasing uh, representation in the authors that we include in our syllabi, um, as educators, we have uh, the opportunity to challenge uh, the deficit focus um, when, we're, when we're talking about neurodiversity. Um, as a developmental psychologist, I teach this sort of stuff all the time, um, but people in other fields um, also, this, this is I'm sure relevant to um, so in recent years, um, more strength-based models of neurodiversity have, um, have entered the literature. So the uh, medical model that's been dominant for the, for the last few de um, decades has been almost exclusively focused on, um, uh, on examining causality through focuses, focus on specific deficits at different, different levels. Um, so for neurodivergent people, uh, cognitive profiles have for a long time been characterized really only in terms of impairment and deficit and what's wrong. But the neurodiversity paradigm uh, challenges this. So there was a recent um, uh, great review in uh, the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry by Elizabeth Pelicano and Jack De uh, Den Hooting, who, who talk about this paradigm shift in autism science in this case, and give some really interesting examples of um, how what even uh, how characteristics of autistic um, cognition, um, even when they could well be described as strengths, have historically in the scientific literature been almost exclusively um, characterized in terms of deficit. So uh, one example from Liz Pelicano's own work that she gives in the past where uh, she conducted some experimental work uh, looking at perceptual after effects um, after looking at faces in autistic children. Um, and she found that there was a reduced perceptual after effect in autistic compared to non-autistic non children and interpreted that as a sign of a functional deficit. Um, having engaged with uh, the neurodiversity paradigm and as a key proponent of the neurodiversity paradigm, she now reinterprets that um, uh, the same data as a strength. So autistic children's face recognition following the ad adaptation was actually more accurate than non-autistic non children. So this is just one example of how a difference in cognition um, uh, often gets presented uh, in the light of deficits against a neurotypical standard. Um, so we can, we, can change, we can change that. So on the slide here are just some examples of um, uh, cognitive styles that are typically presented as deficits in the scientific literature. Uh, so a deficit in perseveration, for example, could, be, could equally be presented as a strength in persistence and focused attention. Um, big picture thinking, uh, so weak central coherence accounts of autism, for example, can be presented as um, a strength in attention to detail. Uh, response inhibition, the characteristic of ADHD can also be uh, uh, flipped and seen as a strength in fast problem solving and decision making. So the neurodiversity paradigm challenges us to um, notice and harness these strengths um, in our teaching in the way that we talk about neurodiversity and in the way that we interact with our neurodivergent students. Thanks, Magda. Okay, so I'm going to pass back to Magda. So we wanted to incorporate this into our lesson plans that we are going to share with you. And I hope you have them open in um, a tab. If not, uh, it might be a good idea to go back to the first slide and click on this. Um, I am also going to show you this and I'm hoping that I won't get lost <laughs> with sharing. <laughs> okay, uh, so we have prepared for you uh, a bank of resources, which you can access through the link given on the slides. And there we go, our bank looks like this. 
So it's a series of 10 lessons, which all focus on promotion, open scholarship and neurodiversity in the academia. I am going to show you how we promote what uh, Lorna has just discussed through showing you the first lesson. And here we invite our students to read an article which was written over a hundred years ago by Lombroso, uh, where he's uh, discussing left-handedness um, and where his bias towards right-handedness is very much visible. He uses very pathologizing language um, to describe left-handedness, but also this very short piece of writing shows his bias towards women, uh, negative bias towards women, people of races other than white, um, as well as individuals suffering from mental health problems and those who have um, criminal re record. Now, this piece of um, um, writing reads rather badly today. So it shows how those biases become visible um, with the course of time and how something that may not be visible a hundred years ago um, something that is accepted by the society might stand out later on. Another example um, that we use to communicate this to our student is through an activity like this. So this time we look at language used in recent publications on neurodiversity. Um, this time we ask students to have a look at the language and Oh, sorry, let me just share again. And analyze how the language used pathologizes neurodiversity. Can I just ask you quickly whether this is okay? Right, so um, you are going to have um, an opportunity to look at the exercises a little bit later if you would like to engage with them and see how they work. Um, but I am just going to very quickly talk you through them. So we look at um, examples of abnormal time processing in ASD and we ask students to think of what abnormal suggests and what sort of feelings the word abnormal invokes. We also ask them to think about who decides about what is normal and what is abnormal and whether the same traits could be considered normal in different cultures. A similar example with detecting the risks of autism spectrum disorder. Again, what does risk here suggest? And what does disorder imply? So it's an activity where we invite students to notice these things and discuss them together. Okay. Um... So as well as increasing representation, um, the second pillar of neurodiversifying our curriculum is thinking about the language that we use uh, when we talk about cognitive neurological diversity. Um, so in order to create an environment of trust with our neurodivergent students, it's really important that educators are mindful in the, in the language that we use when talking about these subjects and um, make a conscious effort to avoid discriminatory or pathologizing terminology, um, whilst being uh, aware that the language of neurodiversity is evolving all the time. There are multiple, sometimes conflicting views. This is not an easy, um, e easy area at the moment. People, including neurodivergent people, have very strong and different views on this. But as educators, we can acknowledge that diversity in view uh, and we can be respectful and we can talk to our students about their own language preferences. Um, we can be aware, um, aware of double empathy barriers in the classroom, and I'll talk about that a, a little more in a moment. Um, uh, double empathy really refers to the, the uh, difficulties in communication and mutual understanding between people with different experiences of the world and especially across uh, neurotypes. Um, and we can model uh, respect for minorities in the way um, that we behave and in the way that we um, talk about diversity. Thanks, Manta. 
Um, so Christina Botoma Boitel and colleagues uh, recently published um, a paper on this, which challenges us to think about the connotations of very common uh, terminology in the scientific literature and, and, and educational literature on cognitive diversity. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, and they challenge us to think about how these terms might be received by people um, who might fall within these, these groups. So some of them are uh, potentially challenging, uh, even to those of us who are writing and thinking about this all of the time. Uh, so special needs, for example, is a very commonly accepted term in the UK to um, describe uh, children in school who have additional educational um, needs, so including neurodivergent students. Uh, but these authors challenge us to think about how um, infantilizing this term might be for someone who falls into that group and, uh, and propose uh, more neutral alternatives, which might be um, taking care to actually describe the specific needs of an individual rather than placing them in this group. I won't go through every, every single one, but uh, for example, um, the use of person first language, so a person with autism, uh, which uh, has historically been recommended by uh, psychological bodies um, so that the person is not defined by their diagnosis, so it's well-intentioned, but there's good evidence, certainly in the Anglophone world, that many neurodivergent people prefer um, an identity first uh, terminology, so an autistic person rather than a person with autism, because uh, the autism is not separable from, from the person, it's, it's a core part of who they are. Um, and others, so medicalized terminology like comorbid and symptoms can easily be uh, replaced with more neutral, less uh, value-laden um, alternatives like co-occurring or traits or characteristics. The references for these papers um, are included at the end of the slides. Thanks, Magda. Um, so using potentially stigmatizing terminology in the classroom when we're talking about these things is one good way to set up a double empathy barrier in the classroom. Um, so the double empathy problem was first described by Damien Milton, um, an autistic sociologist um, at the University of Kent in 2012, where he wrote, uh, wrote a paper on the ontology of autism, so how we understand what autism is in the world, um, and uh, discusses um, the harm done to autistic people by uh, the scientific communities. Uh, characterization of autism as um, defined by a deficit in empathy. He challenges our understanding what, of what empathy is and whether, whether it's a within individual characteristic or whether it's something that is created uh, between individuals in interaction. Um, so this nice little infographic here is from uh, Catherine Crompton's paper in Frontiers uh, for Young Minds that came out a couple of years ago um, and it gives a uh, a really nice just su summary of this idea of double empathy. So while an autistic person might struggle to read between the lines uh, of um, communication and, and process non-literal language, they might also um, struggle to overcome other people's misconceptions about autism while also managing sensory distractions. On the other hand, the non-autistic person in interaction may struggle to form positive first impressions about the autistic people and that's well evidenced by um, some really nice experimental work how um, uh, neurotypical people for, form very quick negative uh, judgments about autistic people based on very little information. They may struggle to understand uh, what autism is and how it affects the individual, and they may struggle to imagine what autistic sensory difficulties might feel like. And so both parties might struggle to understand each other's thoughts, feelings and behaviour. This is not a deficit that is with it within the autistic person, it's a deficit, it's a problem that occurs in interaction and is exacerbated when two people have very different experiences of the world. Thanks, Magda. And there's more and more writing coming out at the moment about how these double um, empathy barriers might manifest in the classroom. Uh, so if I think it's really important as educators, we interrogate the expectations that we have of our students. Um, and often our expectations of the way students might participate or um, engage in our classes is perhaps neuronormative. So we might um, uh, interpret a student who is closing their eyes or wearing headphones as uh, not engaged in what we're saying, whereas in fact, uh, some many neuro neurodivergent students say that this is in order to fill, filter, out, 
filter out sensory um, distractions and be able to re really focus on what's um, being covered. Uh, we might um, infer uh, a student who is unwilling to take part in group work as disengaged, whereas in fact there might be other reasons behind that. And um, often ne uh, neurodivergent behaviours uh, from students in the classroom, I think, are um, wrongly interpreted as having bad intentions. Um, another barrier might be that we have stereotyped expectations of what um, uh, an autistic learner um, is capable of or what they're not capable of, or what a dyslexic learner might struggle with, or what um, uh, uh, a young person with developmental language disorder can and can't do, whereas in fact all, all of the research uh, from the last uh, decade or two on these conditions, uh, one thing that it does agree on is how wide a heterogeneity is within all of these diagnoses and uh, the uh, well-worn phrase, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And so having these uh, uh, stereotyped ideas about what an individual is capable of and not capable of can be harmful within a classroom setting. To Magda. Okay, so let's see how gracefully I can actually exit this presentation and um, move on to the materials. Uh, again, I am going to show you how we have incorporated some of these things into the lesson plans that we have prepared for you. Um, I think you can now see the lesson plans. And I am going to flip to a lesson titled Respect for Neurodiversity. So here students are invited to reflect on what neurodiversity, sorry, what diversity in general is. And um, they discuss dimensions of diversity. So they focus on concepts such as cultural humility, uh, think about culture, race, gender, age, social class, and so on. Uh, we also present them with the academic will of privilege, which has been developed by uh, the neurodiversity group. And through uh, this tool, the students can uh, self-reflect on their own privilege. They can think of how the dim dimensions describe them and how their experience based on their be belonging to different uh, groups might um, might be different compared to people who uh, who would describe their belonging differently. And if that's okay, I would like to actually invite you to reflect on this and to use the tool we have created again. Okay, I think you can see it now. This is the academic will of privilege. And what you can see in front of you, if you look at the very outer part of the wheel, these are dimensions of diversity. So for example, gender, sexuality, neurodiversity, mental health. So I would like you to look at the dimensions of privilege um, on the outside. And then think of which of the options inside the circle suit you best. So for every answer in the smallest circle, the closest to the middle of the wheel, give yourself one point, then two points for each of them in the middle, and then three points for um, any option to the outside of the circle. I'll give you a moment to just reflect on this. Um, and again, this is just um, an activity to make students aware that their experience might be very different to other people's experience, and they sometimes might see the world uh, through their privilege. It also allows them to understand and reflect on intersectionality. I'm actually thinking that we might get back to this when we have a little bit of time in the workshop and we'll just continue with the presentation. So stay tuned. Thanks, Magda. Um, so the third and final pillar of our neurodiversification um, agenda is designing and delivering our, our teaching for diversity. 
And there's there's lots of pedagogical literature um, out there already that can be um, harnessed for a neurodiversity affirmative approach. Um, so strength-based approaches to learning in the classroom, notice what our students' particular strengths are and build on those to um, engage them in what we're trying to teach. So whether it's in how, for example, a student who has um, excellent attention to detail but might struggle with group work a bit more, so bringing them into group work by, for example, giving them um, a data management role or a, a, a kind of checking role at the end. Um, Social justice um, pedagogy aims to develop consciousness of injustice while empowering students to work for justice. Compassionate pedagogies uh, uh, invite us to notice distress in the classroom where it exists and students are distressed often, uh, even uh, with, with our best intentions um, and to act to alleviate that distress. And universal design for learning or UDL, um, which um, invites us to design curricula to be accessible to the widest possible range of learners in the class, classroom, not only neurodivergent students, but all students. Um, in fact, all of these uh, approaches have uh, clear benefits for everybody in the classroom, not just neurodivergent students. Thanks, Maita. So just a little bit um, um, of uh, more detail on UDL, which um, I am currently trialing in my own teaching and I find, I'm finding really, um, really great for um, the neurodivergent students I'm working with. Um, so there's loads of literature on this that you can look at, but um, effectively universal design for learning is about giving students choice, flexibility and autonomy in how they engage with the material that we're trying to teach them. Um, so this can be through multiple means of engagement. So acknowledging that our students have uh, differ in, the, in what motivates them, in their attention, and what, what brings them in, and um, designing our teaching to accommodate that, that diversity. So some students are motivated by spontaneity and invention, and uh, for some that's much more uncomfortable, uncomfortable for example. So we might design uh, classroom activities that have a, a variety of activities, choice in the group activities, some technological options, and parts where students can choose the content that they're engaging with and so on in order to um, harness um, ind individual differences in motivation. We can present our content uh, through multiple means of representation. Um, so uh, um, obviously uh, scientific and academic papers are a core part of what we do, but they're uh, using blogs and video and visual materials, uh, not, not to, um, uh, it says here learning styles, not in terms of the, the debunked uh, visual uh, kinesthetic learning styles, but just acknowledging the differences in the way that, that the ways that people um, best engage with information and even intra individual um, variation. So at certain points, a student might be able to engage very well with an academic research papers, uh, paper and other times they might need something a bit different, a blog or a podcast or a, a different way into the topic. And then finally, um, multiple means of action and expression. So giving cho students choice in the way that they demonstrate what they've learned. Um, so I am currently working with my class on the, the, um, translating some scientific information for a non-specialist audience. And I'm using this, this UDL technique for the first time. Um, and I thought I might get um, uh, just a, a lot of written information sheets or, or blog sheets, but in fact, I've got um, an animation coming and uh, somebody who's doing a TikTok video. I'm really excited to see what the students produce because um, and my neurodivergent students in particular have talked about how this choice, the choice in harnessing the things that they're already good at and they already love is increasing their motivation with uh, the material. Thanks, Magda. So here's an example of uh, how our materials foster autonomy through providing choice uh, to students and by that uh, incorporate universal design for learning. So this task is taken from uh, lesson two, uh, delivering for diversity. Uh, this lesson focuses on diversity, um, not only in academia, but generally um, on diversity. So students here are um, presented with a task, but instead of uh, just giving them one choice, there are two options. And I think this is something that I have 
incorporate it into my teaching fairly recently. Um, I understood that not all students actually like working in groups and not all students benefit from social interaction. And for some students, this can be highly stressful um, and difficult to participate in. So in our materials, we try to provide a choice of activities. And that's usually quite difficult in the classroom, but um, we believe that um, it is possible. And here is an, an example. So students here are asked to um, go through an interactive text and they have a choice of either doing uh, a jigsaw reading where they divide part of the text between the members of the group, uh, then they skim the text and summarize it to each other, which can then be followed by a discussion. Um, however, the um, option B that they're given is uh, to work on their own and again, look at the text, skim it quickly and create a mind map and uh, a mind map or a poster. And again, they are invited then to exchange those with other students so they can still benefit from the exchange of uh, knowledge, but they can decide on their own how much they want to participate in social interaction and how much they prefer to reflect on the material and um, deal with it on their own. Okay, so just before we um, invite you to uh, join some groups and, and uh, reflect on this in your own work, uh, just thought we'd finish by summarizing what a neurodiversity affirming education uh, might achieve and what it, what it might be. So we would define neurodiversity affirming education as uh, teaching that expects diversity, expects the classroom to be diverse in the way that they think, in the way they interact with information and with each other. And, and designs curricula for that diversity. Uh, a neurodiversity affirming uh, education empowers students to be self advocates where they need to be by um, reducing stigma um, and by um, uh, increasing students' comfort to, to disclose and to talk about difference where, where they feel comfortable doing so. Uh, it fights stigma by use of non pathologizing and discriminatory language um, and uh, by uh, increasing representation of neurodiversity. Um, and it profiles uh, students at the individual level, not, not at the label level. So understanding their difference um, is not defined by the diagnosis that they might have received and their um, strengths and weaknesses are going to be individual and harnessing those in the classroom. Okay, so we would like to now invite you um, to engage with our materials a little bit, uh, to get to know them um, to some extent and maybe go through the activities that I have given you as examples, and also to engage in a discussion with each other. So we have drafted here three questions that we would like you to reflect on. So first of all, we would like you to think about some easy solutions or strategies that you could implement um, in order to help all students to manage their time better. Do you think of how to scaffold uh, these abilities or do you just expect that the students will know that? In my teaching, I think at the beginning, I expected students to know that. Now I focus a little bit more on actually making um, teaching that a bit more explicit and talking about this in the classroom a bit more. Uh, we would also like you to maybe think of a time when you had a conflict or a misunderstanding, which could be caused by the double empathy barrier. How could you approach a similar situation, taking the neurodiversity paradigm into consideration next time? And finally, we would like you to think of a lesson or course you have developed and think of three ways in which it could be neurodiversified, looking at the points we have just covered. I am going to um, divide you into breakout rooms, if that's okay. Um, and in those breakout rooms, we would invite you to reflect on these questions and also to go through the uh, resources that we have uh, created and maybe discuss them together. We will give you 15 minutes 
we have 20 minutes or 15 minutes should be okay um, and we will assign you automatically so I can see that uh, we have 10 participants so I will create three breakout rooms and we will assign you automatically so in a moment you should be directed to a breakout room um, the link to all the resources can be found on OSF. Yeah, I can also paste it in a moment in the chat. Um, get together and discuss the questions. <laughs> 